Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome, everybody, to another Lazy CEO podcast. My name is Jim Schlexer. I am your host today, and I am the uh, CEO of the CEO Project, where we help uh, CEOs through CEO peer groups. Today, we have a really fun guest. Um, and, uh, you know, some of you, if you've been to sort of significant speaking, you know, opportunities, uh, you may have seen him before because he is a Hall of Fame speaker, uh, has spoken to Gosh, I'm going to say probably a million people in your career, Jay. I bet I'm not wrong on that. Um, has had multiple best-selling books. Has uh, also in the Hall of Fame of the Word of Mouth, uh, Mouth Marketing Association. Um, so just literally, you know, one of the guys that we could possibly talk to about how to grow your business through uh, through marketing. So welcome, Jay Bear. Thank you so much. Fantastic to be here. Being the CEO of the CEO Project is very, very meta, right? It's it, it's almost like Gru, right? You have like a, the minions and the whole, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, it's also designed to be a tongue twister. So you just Great. say 12 times fast after Bravo. some tequila. So <laughs> on the topic of tequila, I need to yes, start sir. right there because, okay, great. and we may not get to any other topics, frankly. Um, so I am uh, a certified sommelier. Yeah, uh, nice. wine, Right, yes. yeah. Um, did WCT and did quarter master sommeliers. And you. I did not know that there was such a thing as a, tequila sommelier until I saw it in your profile. So yeah. I went and looked it up yep. and yep. it's a real thing. Oh yeah. Catador. Yeah. There's, uh, it's not quite as um, buttoned up as the sommelier program in terms of the governing bodies and the organizations and the processes. I mean, it is Mexico after all, uh, but increasingly as tequila grows in popularity and it's seen runaway growth, 16% up just last year in the U S alone, uh, there's more and more infrastructure uh, around that, trying to help consumers make better decisions. Nice. Yeah. And did you do it in Spanish? No, no. Fortunately, I did not have to do it in Spanish. In fact, <laughs> uh, <laughs> though I am the number two tequila influencer in the world, non-celebrity division. Uh, so, so <laughs> yeah, not, oh, not, we, not, we grade yeah. them, huh? <laughs> well, you know, because The Rock owns a tequila, Kendall Jenner owns a tequila, Sammy Hagar yeah. owns a tequila, George Clooney owns a tequila. So I'm not up in there, but amongst mortals, I am the I'm the number two tequila influencer. Uh, but it is hilarious that uh, very often my my fans uh, barbecue me for my very very uh, poor Spanish pronunciation. And despite the fact that I spent the first forty years of my life in Arizona, I was not good at Spanish in high school nor college. In fact, I yeah. cheated my way out of college. Uh, to, in my last Spanish final, I had to have my sister in law take it, who was a Spanish major. Uh, and that's the only way I got out of college, even though I was on a full ride scholarship. I, I'm, I've written six books, all of them in English, uh, and there's a reason. Yeah. For that. There you go. Um, awesome. Well, I guess the statute of limitations is up, so we can talk about uh, what happened in college. I hope, I right? hope so. Yeah, I, mean, I have the <laughs> diploma. So what are they going to do? Yeah. So, um, so let's let's move over to marketing. I mean, which is beyond your love of you know, and I do. I'm I'm sure you fantasize like I do sometimes. Like, man, if I could make a living on tequila. I'm that would there. be way I'm fun, get, I'm right? I'm getting there. I'm, I, it's, getting there. It's okay. coming together. We've got sponsors now, and I've got some brand uh, clients and, and other things. So uh, yeah. certainly not ready to stop speaking, but but uh, I can see it from here, which is kind of uh, yeah. ki kind of exciting. And, and and actually, there's a lot of correlation between marketing and tequila because it's such an incredibly competitive business. There are well, more than two thousand tequila brands, and two hundred new ones last year alone. Yeah. And, and, and well, it's, a, it's a ground war in Asia. It is a really tough, tough uh, business to break into if you don't have some sort of disproportionate celebrity rocket fuel that's like, you know, you, you, you make a video and everybody knows the brand, um, which is why in, in most places in the U.S., most restaurants and bars and, and even most um, smaller liquor stores, you know, you see the same brands, right? You see the, the nationally distributed brands that are owned by major spirits conglomerates. And it's not that they're the best tequila. In fact, they're usually no. the worst tequila. No, they have they've, got the best, they've got the distribution, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they have coast to coast distribution and awesome. uh, it's tough to, tough to come by. Well, beyond the excellent Princess Bride ref there, and I did notice <laughs> it, um, <laughs> um, 
uh, let, let's go to marketing. Like, so we, yep. our audience is mostly CEOs. Um, most of us didn't come up in marketing. You know, yep. we might be an engineer, knucklehead, or finance, finance sure. person, or whatever. Um, and yet, we've got this whole marketing crew working for us, particularly these youngsters doing digital marketing. Mm-hmm. What would you? What are like the five things that we need to be smart about in engaging with that group to ask the right questions as CEOs? Yeah, I think part of it is like I, I am. I have started in digital in 1993 mm-hmm. when, when domain names were free, so I have seen the the entire evolution of this business. But I wasn't in digital originally, right? I was I was in journalism and then magazine and I was in television and radio, and then got into digital. And I think partially because it's obviously the fastest growing and all around us now and so transformative, we tend to think that digital is good just because it's digital. And right. and as a CEO, I would question that assumption. Um, so often the coin of the realm in digital is reach and awareness and how many people saw your thing or, or and, and I guess my retort to that is to what end, right? You, right. you can't- no, Those are vanity you, metrics, come on. You can't sell exposure, right? Um, yeah. not, not at scale. And, and so uh, typically what, what we try to advise uh, CEOs to do is to say, okay, what desired action are we trying to create here? Is it net new customers? Is it increase in customer purchase frequency? Is it average customer value on an annualized basis? Is it customer retention? Start with what we're trying to uh, incentivize from a behavior standpoint, and then and then build upwards from there. Create a series of of digital and many non digital as well scenarios that that allow that to happen. But the reality is that most digital strategists don't. They they start right. with the caboose, not the engine. And right. then they try to gerrymander their way into the appropriate solution. And that's why so much digital strategy is inherently flawed, actually. Yeah. And I've seen too many PowerPoint presentations from the marketing team about, you know, clicks and eyeballs. And I'm like, so how many dollars did this generate? And they go, hum and hum and hum and hum and I don't know, right? And, and, and this is the great irony, I think, from a CEO standpoint. One, one of the reasons I got into digital is that it is so inherently measurable. Yeah. I started in politics. That was my first career. I was a political campaign consultant and I loved politics and still do because at the end of the day, there is no ambiguity on the success equation. You either got elected or you lost, right? Nobody's like, well, it did okay, right? I mean, it's, you know, the the party is either really fun or really somber uh, on election night and that's it. Digital has the same kind of clarity available Yet, I mean, it's so much more measurable incrementally than than outdoor or print or television or radio. Uh, it's just by far the easiest to understand the trajectory of success or lack thereof that you're experiencing. Yet, Jim, the crazy part is so many people don't take advantage of that. Yeah, you, you well, and that's why I love it as an engineer. You don't use it. Yeah, I, I love it as an engineer because it's quantifiable. Absolutely, you know, like, absolutely. My favorite part. So. Yep. And, and obviously it makes testing a lot easier as well, which as somebody who actually came up in the direct mail business, to me, that's, that's the holy grail. Like, I, you know, what I used to always tell clients when I did more consulting, they'd say, well, Jay, what do you think about this and that? And I was like, I, I don't know the answer, but I know how to find out, right? right. Which we're going to test this, and then we're going to test this, and we're going to test this, and they will have unassailable truth. Or we yep. could just sit around here and order another pizza and guess your call. <laughs> What kind of pizza? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and I and I actually think that iterative process of you know let's run ten tests because it's cheap, gather data, and then we have a king of the hill in terms yep. of offer. Yep. And, and then, by the way, let's not stop there. Let's yep. iterate some more. See if we can come up with a better answer. Like testing should never end in my book. Oh That's- man, you nailed it. ABT always be testing. I used to do a lot of email uh, consulting back in the day. Uh, and, and the rule of thumb is you should never send an email that doesn't include a test, right? Time of day, day a week, subject line, from line. And as soon as you've kind of gone through your testing sequence, right? So typically that is something like from line, subject line, day of week, time of day, um, uh, then usually some body copy tests, maybe some layout tests. So there's usually a six or seven email testing array that you would go through. As soon as you finish that six or seven series, then you start at number one again. Right. So we just did it the other day for, for my own newsletter, the Bear Facts. It comes out every two weeks. You know, we we done some uh, time of day, day of week testing uh, in the fall, and now it's background. Let's test it again because your audience changes and how they use technology changes, and and maybe people who have kids 
uh, check email at a different time when school is in session versus when school isn't in session, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So uh, right. it's all knowable and, and uh, only a fool chooses to not know. All right. Awesome. Although it's a lot of data to work with. I mean, it really it is. is. It is. Um, yeah. And that's, but... that's the other, that is the, huh, the interesting corollary to digital, right? Is that it is so measurable that sometimes you are surrounded by data, but starved for insights. And that's right. how you determine, I think, the best digital strategist is, is to ask them, okay, what are the three metrics that you care about and why? And, and what is, can, what's the right answer to that question? Uh, totally depends. Depends on the project. Depends on the, as I said, it depends on what you're trying to, um, what, what kind of consumer behavior you're trying to incentivize. I mean, ultimately, uh, it should helicopter back to, to whatever business success metric you're looking at. Could be, could be sales, could be churn rate, could be you know, uh, could be new employee applications if you're trying to fix a staffing problem with digital, et cetera. So there's a lot of different. Um, Got it. So the, when I ask that question, my marketers or my digital marketers, they, the good one will say, what's your business problem and how are you going to measure? How are you going to know we're, be, we're successful against that business problem? And then that's my metric right there. You, yes. they, they're not going to tell you, you're going to tell them. I love it. Um, I, I saw you do a piece a while ago on, um, and maybe you could talk to this, on uh, the customer journey and providing information at the point of need, mm -hmm. right? So, yep. you know, the finance person has a certain profile when they're buying, particularly a complicated product, mm -hmm. and their information needs are particular. Yep. You know, yep. the CEO is different. The, 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 maybe the engineering lead is different. And where they are in the explore, decide, you know, post-sale, Mm -hmm. Talk to because you built a grid on that that I thought was really fascinating and useful about providing information content in each of those boxes. Yeah, I mean, like the reality is that we all come from an era where personal time and and one to one or small group communication in person, uh, you know, over over a video call, etc., has been held up for many many years, especially in B two B as as sort of the the goal right so if we can provide enough information to get them interested we'll make sure uh, a bdr or somebody kind of qualifies this lead and then we'll give them to a salesperson and then we'll have a sales conversation and eventually they'll become customers that, that's sort of yep. the historical process and it still works but now what we find especially amongst younger buyers uh millennials and, and gen z about half of them actually prefer a completely seller free experience they don't want to talk to nobody about nothing. They're like, just, just give me the stuff and I'll figure out what to buy and whether to buy it and which options to select. I mean, think about how, how Tesla sells cars, right? I mean, yep. you, it just click on the website and here's your invoice, right? It's a car. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. So by my way of thinking, because of, of all the changes that have happened from a technology standpoint, most of your prospects are further down the consideration funnel once they raise their hand than, than you would think they are, right? And there's mm -hmm. been studies uh, about that from the CEB and, and other groups over time. And so the exercise that I talk about a lot on stage is, is I'll ask CEOs, all right, grab a piece of paper and a pen, and I want you to write down the 25 questions that your customers have most often about your business, your products, your services pre-purchase. And of course, every CEO can do it, right? That's what they think about. Now, take a look at that list. How many of those questions can be answered by a prospect on your website within two clicks? Hmm. And it's usually about four yeah. out of 25. Sounds, sounds like a problem. Yeah, we're just, we're just making people work too hard to get the information they need. And, and you know, it, it, this is probably overstated by half, but that's okay. As a thought exercise, I think it's useful. What if your customers could never talk to anybody at your company? Mm -hmm. What if you didn't have an email address? What if you didn't have a phone? What if you didn't have a chat bot? Could you still sell stuff? And if the answer is no, you should probably rethink that. Interesting. You know, I think, I think um, Allstate had a great ad series a while ago. It's uh, people when you want them, technology when you don't. Yeah, right. Which is which is should be the the mantra for all sort of chatbots and and human agent assisted uh, online help um, because sometimes you know it's a bot and that's okay because you're just like what time does the flight leave but sometimes you've got a question that requires a uh, nuance and then trying to be shoehorned into whatever 
prompt sequence that bot has been programmed to execute can be uh, very challenging indeed. Yeah, interesting. You know, the corollary to that would be my son's comment, which is, ew, humans, I don't want to talk to people. Well, <laughs> right? Yeah. So. You know, again, that's, it's an overstatement, but, but general. Oh, general, no, it isn't. No, he would actually no, not say in his that. Case, sure. But, but generationally, <laughs> uh, yes, there, that is very much, I mean, look, uh, my kids who are 24 and 21, they don't even, I mean, they will actively avoid using the telephone. Mm-hmm. My daughter is a marketing director for a software company in Paris and yet never uses the telephone. Right. Because to them, it's such a waste of time and invasion of privacy and awkward. Now they'll text all day long and Snapchat and, and all the other uh, personas, but, but to, to actually have a, a synchronous conversation feels like being stabbed to them. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really interesting. Yep. yep. Well, and, and I think your generational comment is on point. That this is only going to get worse or better, depending on how you look at it. Right. But it'll be yeah. more and more digital and yep. less yep. and less human. Yep. And uh, as sure that, at some level, I'm sure the same is true for you. Like I, I used to get, and not, not in the way back, you know, not in the eighties, but like in the relatively recent past, I would get, I don't know, 10, 15 telephone calls a day from clients, from prospects, from friends, from just whatever, right? And now I get approximately zero calls a day that aren't spam. I mean, literally zero. But I've got all these other inboxes to check, right? I've got yeah. obviously text and I've got Instagram and I've got Messenger and I've got Twitter and I've got all these other places, right? So it, we've just kind of offloaded a, you know, synchronous conversation and instead adopted asynchronous conversation, which has its advantages, but also, of course, its drawbacks. Got it. So just riff on that, you know, asynchronous communication. And um, this is riffing off Hug Your Haters, one of your, book, your recent books. You know, you're, you, and, and there's great research on um, the way to build a loyal client is not to be perfect all the time. The way to build a loyal client is to screw up and then recover really, really well. Amazing. And then they're loyal for life at that point, right? So talk to that, and particularly with regard to asynchronous communication, sort of, you know, uh, uh, in that space, right? Yeah, it, you know, asynchronous is, is is generally more efficient for both parties mm. until it until it's not, <laughs> because I don't have to, we don't have to coordinate schedules, right? You don't have to send me a meeting notice for, for us to have a text exchange. And so there is a real um, attraction to, to that to that premise. Um, but, you know, my, one of my very, very first bosses, when I was just a kid, I would probably let's say I was 24 or five, uh, was the publisher of Phoenix Magazine and a number of other things. And this is when email first, you know, kind of started taking root in the business world. And he said, Jay, by the time you get to the third email, it would have been faster to just talk to him on the phone. And I've always lived that premise uh, and tried to teach it to my kids as well failed miserably. Uh, yeah. but, but, but the idea that, you know, at some point, it's actually just easier to do this at the same time. And, and my wife, God bless her, uh, and, and her friends are famous, you know, and, and I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, you know, it's, it's a text, it's like a 700 word text message. I'm like, this is like my Moby Dick of text. This is, I think, I think we at this point, no one can type that fast. And she refuses to use voice text, right? Like she's not talking into the phone. It's literally tickety, clickety, clickety, clackety, clickety. And I'm oh like, my God. at some oh. point, let's just, let's just change, change this process. But uh, as you said, you know, eventually uh, businesses have to adopt what their customers select. It's one of the things that really bothers me from a customer service standpoint. I think CEOs in particular need to uh, lead the charge on this. We've got to interact with customers using the channels that they prefer, not necessarily the channels that we prefer or our business prefers or are most efficient for our business. I got hired by a big hospital chain um, a few years ago and they said, Jay, uh, we're getting a lot of customer complaints and a lot of negative feedback, but we did the analysis and it's weird, all of the complaints almost entirely are via email. What, what do you make of that? And so I did some analysis and I said, well, here's the thing. Um, everywhere that you say to people that they can get a hold of you, the only channel that you 
publish is your email address. They don't yeah. know what your phone number is. They don't know what your social media is. You've given them one alley to walk down and now you're surprised that that's the alley that they've selected. Uh, but some people don't want to use email. So, you, and then look, it's hard for business. It's hard to say, look, we're going to essentially run a contact center across seven different contact modalities. I get how hard that is, but them's the breaks. Like, you know, it's not the old days where it was face-to-face and fax, right? And that was it. Like, we don't have that advantage anymore. Yeah. That's some, well, I can tell you in the medical profession, I mean, I, I wish my doctor, I, I, sometimes you want a prescription refilled. You're like, I just want to send an email yes. and get it done. Yes. And no, I got to talk to a, a damn human. Right. And I don't want to do that. Right. It's so fascinating. It's, it's one of the areas where you're seeing the greatest bifurcation between uh, tech embrace and, and, and sort of um, being dragged along because there are, uh, I've, I've got, you know, multiple physicians, you know, dentists and doctors and this and that and chiropractors, whatever. And, and some of them are super digital. They never want to yeah. talk to you. It's all text message. It's like, you know, press one to confirm your appointment, press two to get your, your prescription refilled, et cetera. And I'm like, oh, God bless you. And then you've got the ones who are like, we've got to come into the office and have us right. like re-sign the piece of paper. I'm like, is this 1975? Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, it well, is, the, it is the problem is billing codes, right? Yes. That's how it becomes a billable interaction. So it's actually the, the insurance companies that are making you waste your time, yes. believe it or not. Well, so, yeah. Shocking. Yeah. yeah, shocking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, those guys again. Um, so, you know, one of the things I know you talk about is word of mouth marketing mm-hmm. and referrals, obviously, yeah. is something all of us don't have enough of, right? Or would yeah. like to have more of. Yeah. So maybe just give us a little thinking around, uh, you know, if I want to generate more referrals in my business, what would be the couple of things I should be thinking about? Yeah. So the reason I, I, about every two years, I come out with a new research study and a new book and then a new speech, et cetera. And, and that's based on two things. One, my work with hundreds and hundreds of brands and, and two, just the research and then my own assessment of, of customer expectations uh, and customer behavior and how it changes over time. So I'm not, a, I'm not a futurist, I don't have tarot cards, but what I do try to provide businesses is a lever that they can pull over a two to three year period that will allow them to outperform their competition if they change their area of emphasis. Now, word of mouth has been a customer acquisition strategy since the first caveman sold an arrowhead to another caveman, but, literally 1% of businesses have a defined and documented word of mouth strategy, Mm. which is bonkers to me because in many cases, word of mouth is if not the primary way that you get new customers, certainly a secondary or tertiary way. And we just take it for granted. And it's for this very reason, Jim. Throughout modern business history, let's say since the second world war, at least in American business, we've kind of sold ourselves a lie. And the lie is that competency will create conversations, that if you just run a good business, people will naturally tell other people about you. Mm. And that seems to make sense on paper, but it doesn't hold water in terms of actual human behavior, right? In order for you to introduce the topic of a business, a product, a service to your friends and colleagues, something unexpected must happen. Mm. We don't talk about good. We talk about different. And this is why you almost never see three-star reviews. It's the same premise, right? Why would you write a three-star review? I got about what I paid for, three stars, yeah. right? So all your reviews are five-star or one-star. And so word of mouth works the same way. So in my book, Talk Triggers, that's, that's what we call it, is it's an operational choice that you make in your business that is designed to create conversations. And it's not your core product or service. It's something else that you do differently that people say, oh, I didn't think that was going to happen. And that becomes the story that they tell their friends and colleagues. You've got to give people a story. And it, it literally is, you know, a strategic execution of a playbook to create word of mouth. Most people just say it'll take care of itself and it will not. Right. Yeah. Well, that feels like the engineer saying, just build a better product or build a better mousetrap and the world yeah. beat a, a path yeah. to your door. It's it, the same logic doesn't work there and doesn't work here. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, like like well, so I, talking about healthcare, CVS, for example, CVS has an incredible talk trigger. They've had it for years, which is when you buy anything at CVS, you get a receipt that's like six feet long. Right? <laughs> is that intentional? hundred percent. 100%. Oh my God. That's their thing. Now, if you go on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere and do a search for CVS plus receipt, you will see thousands and thousands and thousands of tweets and photos and videos and memes 
it, it literally is its own conversational vortex. Uh, and that's not an accident, right? It's a strategy. Oh my God, I, I, you just blew my head up. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, now I'm thinking about all those poor trees that are getting chopped down in support of CBS. They did shorten them up a little bit. They, 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 they used to be longer and, and uh, <laughs> people said, hey, that's a lot of trees. And so they short, they're still very long, yeah. but not, not absurdly long as they used to be. Interesting. You know, this is so Disney-esque, right? So Disney has this concept of magical moments yep. and they are absolutely designed and engineered to create that thing that makes you come back or thing that you're going to talk yes, about yes. to your kids and your grandkids um, yep. or to your grandparents. Absolutely. You know, the other thing it reminds me of is um, Seth, uh, Seth Godin's uh, Purple Cow. Yes. Right. Same, same general idea. Yeah. Uh, Seth and I've spent a lot of time together. And so it's the same general idea. What we did in the talk triggers book is really provide a complete, like, here's how you do it from cradle to grave to measurement framework for people who want to do word of mouth uh, proactively, right? So Seth really talked about the premise of being different and why it works psychologically. We sort of right. took that same idea and then said, okay, but now everybody asks how to do it. So then right. here's how you do it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it feels like, you know, I, I was reflecting on that before the call. I said, you know, my organization, we help CEOs. We should probably come up with some stories that are relatively remarkable stories about what we do for people. Yep. Ones that they would tell somebody else, like, hey, I know this organization. Let me tell you a story about them. Mm -hmm. We teach our clients to tell that story, which then becomes the word of mouth. Or is that's it that okay. controllable? Or am I being too much of an engineer? No, no, that's exactly it. I mean, Sharon talked about it uh, right when we started. So my talk trigger for my speaking business is that I always wear crazy plaid suits on stage. Yep. And it started out um, as as just kind of a you know a differentiator visually. But when it really became a talk trigger and a word of mouth strategy is when we changed it so that meeting planners who hire me to give a presentation get to go to a website, it's dressjbear.com, and all 14 or 15 or whatever of my suits are pictured there, they get to pick out which one I'm going to wear. So if they want to match their logo, they want to contrast with their logo, they just happen to like green, whatever, now they're in on the bit, right? So now they're part of it. And then they tell their friend who's a meeting planner for this other conference. Yeah, Jay was great. But the other thing was really cool is I get to pick his suit, right? So it becomes the conversation point because me being a good speaker is table stakes. They expect right. that, right? It's like there's a, a restaurant in, um, in Sacramento called Skip's Kitchen, which has terrific hamburgers. But their talk trigger is that when you order, it's a kind of menu board thing. After you order, but before you pay, they whip out a deck of playing cards and they fan them out face down in front of you. They say, Jim, pick a card. So if you pick a card, if you get a joker, your entire meal is free. Wow. That's their talk trigger. Now, four people a day win, but everybody gets to play. Yep. And they would not be in business if they didn't have good hamburgers, clearly. But no one's going to tell a story about a good hamburger because there's a lot of places with good hamburgers. Nice. You got to have this little twist on it. And that's that's how the talk trigger works. That's phenomenal. You're making me think of a soup Nazi, right? The soup yeah. is fine, but he abuses you, which is that's really it. cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so well, we, we didn't use that example per se, but we would call that because there's a whole framework of how to do this. Um, the soup Nazi is an example of talkable attitude. Yeah. Usually when you deploy talkable attitude, it's in service of frivolity. And, and, and sort of, um, you know, just take, not taking yourself too seriously. It's usually humor driven, but it can also be the opposite. So Joe's Crab Shack, where, yep. the, where, where the, the waiters insult you when you come in, same example, talkable attitude, but with a negative cast, not a positive cast, soup Nazi, same. Got it. Yeah, Durgan Park is the same way in Boston. Yes. Yep, same yeah. deal. Same idea. Awesome. Yep. Well, that's cool. Well, Jay, this was phenomenal. Um, what didn't I ask that I should have asked of you? Um, I will tell you the thing that I'm talking about this year, uh, the new lever to pull uh, to outflank your competition, and it is speed and responsiveness. I just right. finished some brand new research called The Time to Win. Uh, you can get it, won't cost anything. It's very comprehensive, uh, very uh, high level research. It's thetimetowin.com. And what we found is that more than ever, there's a relationship between responsiveness and revenue that in all elements, every customer interaction, you probably should be faster than you are. And you should probably be putting more time, money, effort as a CEO into pure responsiveness 
uh, because customers care about it more than ever. And you mentioned Disney. One of my key recommendations for this year, based on the research, is to offer in whatever business you're in, including your own, Jim, to offer a fast pass. Mm. The idea that if you charge customers more, but make them wait less, some customers will gladly take you up on that. Now, fast passes exist around us in the economy. TSA Pre is a fast pass. Yep. Clear is a fast pass. The research that we conducted shows that on average, 25% of customers will pay as much as 50% more to not wait. That's a lot of revenue and essentially pure profit because your costs don't really go up. All you're doing is shuffling your customer sequencing. So it doesn't matter if you're running a CEO group or you're a chiropractor or you're a restaurant or you're a public speaker. It doesn't matter. You should offer a fast pass this year. Now, not all your customers will want it, but those who do want it will want it desperately. I was at Caesar's Palace just last week uh, doing a gig and I go, I get there about 2.30 and I go to the front desk and I assume they're going to say, as always, you know, rooms are ready at four because it's casino, it's Vegas. Uh, come back at four, we'll give you keys. Well, they don't give me that spiel. They say, yes, rooms are ready at four. You can come back at four and get your keys. However, oh no, we have a new program that if you give us $30 right now, we'll give you your keys at this time. Would you like that? And I said, <laughs> would I? Here's my money. <laughs> so I actually did uh, some research on this and, and looked at the number of room nights at Caesars and the number of average stays and did a bunch of calculations and the 25% take rate. $1.8 million a year in pure profit just for offering that fast pass. Holy moly. And the room's probably ready, right? Of course it's ready. They didn't do anything different. Yeah, they're not, they're not like, you know, sending in the green berets to get the room ready. It's already ready. It's just <laughs> figuring out, oh, okay, well, this many rooms and this, all they got to do is some triangulation. It's in the yeah. computer. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Well, you, and man, I usually try to get that room by sweet talking them, right? <laughs> right, Gee, right? Is there any way I could, you know, right? Yeah, I'm just off the plane. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that you've done it. <laughs> you've done it. Yeah, here's my 30 bucks. Just right. give me. Yep. That's fine. There you go. Fast pass. I'm telling you. Awesome. Thank you. There's, there is, I uh, just paid for the price of admission, everybody. Fast Perfect. pass. Um, so, Jay, if people want to get more of you, where do they go mm -hmm. to if they want to have you consult or speak or listen to your yeah, podcast or? Where do they go? Thanks so much. Uh, best place is jaybear.com, J-A-Y-B-A-E-R.com. Uh, I've got a newsletter twice a month called The Bear Facts. It has customer experience lessons and book reviews, occasional tequila reviews, et cetera. You can see that, uh, how to sign up on the website. Uh, and then the research, as I mentioned, is thetimetowin.com. Awesome. So uh, two last things. Yep. Why didn't you go into the furniture business? Seventh generation furniture business company. Yep. Why aren't you selling furniture to me? Uh, it wasn't my fault. It was my dad's fault. So yes, our family started a furniture store in 1879 uh, and had it all the way still there, Bears Furniture, York, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. We don't own it anymore, but it's still called Bears Furniture. Uh, the problem was my dad was very, very colorblind, <laughs> which is not no. a great plan if you're selling furniture. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Farmer. This couch will look beautiful in your living room. It's like, Jim, that's brown. Oh, is it? Yeah. So it was just not going to work. Oh, so, that's... Uh, he, he got out of that business. We sold it. Uh, my dad ended up starting five or six companies of his own, uh, not in the furniture business. But uh, yeah, that the, we, the line of succession was broken. There you go. Interesting. Well, that's okay. And then just last one, what's your favorite Indiana joke? Oh, uh, my favorite Indiana joke. All my favorite Indiana jokes are probably about Kentucky. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's okay. Go for it. Um, well, actually, <laughs> um, no, I won't. I'm not going to do it. I, I refuse. I, I'm not. I'm going to keep it classy. Okay. Well, I'm not. So here we go. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, you've got one. Great. That's even better. Oh, I do. Okay. Um, good. So you're in Bloomington, uh, I am. the home of Indiana University, IU, yeah. right? Right down the street, yes. So how many how many IU freshmen does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? None. That's a sophomore class. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm going to repeat so, that purely as this evening. Uh, uh, fairly, I, I, go feel free to use it tonight in your thank you. 
There you uh, go. Awesome. My son, uh, my son's graduating from IU allegedly in like nine weeks. So uh, <laughs> let's let's hope. Uh, yeah, send him awesome. to send him to work for you. There you go, Jay. Thank you so much. This was Appreciate really it. great. Appreciate thank your you. knowledge and your your help. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Cheers. Alrighty. This podcast is brought to you by the CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business, uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com, or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.